chapter number one. And while you're turning there, uh, I ran across a quote from uh, William Gurnall. It's a, one of the classic books, The Christian in Complete Armor. He says, A hypocrite may show some metal at hand, some courage for a spurt in conquering some difficulties, but he will show himself a jade at length. He that hath a false end in his profession will soon come to an end of his profession when he's pinched from the toe where the corn is. I mean to call to deny where his heart aimed at this while. And, uh, he has a way with words, uh, Brother Bruno does. Uh, he said that a false profession will go along as everything's going smooth when you get pinched where the corn is, um, then they'll, they'll fall away. I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, apt way to put it. Ephesians chapter number 1. And uh, we'll start in verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of the glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also he trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, you believed. And let's uh, stop there and we'll go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful tonight for the many blessings that we have received this Lord's Day. We've entered into your house to receive a blessing from your hand today, Lord. And, and we pray even tonight we receive yet another blessing. Whatever we need, Lord, um, we, we ask you to provide that, our spiritual needs here. We all need to be fed and, and we trust that you will use the word tonight to, to feed me as I preach and feed your people as they hear um, that, that what we need spiritually to sustain us and to draw us closer to you or, or to rebuke or reprove or correct or encourage or whatever it is we need, we ask Father that you would uh, provide it tonight. Um, Pray, Lord, that you would bless me as I preach your word and help me to preach in truthfulness. And, and we pray, Lord, that you would help the word to be received tonight. And, and we pray that you would bless those who are not here and desire to be. Um, Sister Brenda, they're back hurting. And, and uh, if James and Paz are traveling, we pray that you bless them. And, and all others who desire and be with those who are not here and not concerned, Lord, we pray for them. Give them a desire to be in your house. We pray, Father, you bless us and keep us and watch over us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I love to think about the gospel. The gospel, of course, is the good news. And I love to think about the gospel. I love to think about what it means. I love to think about its simplicity. Well, the gospel is, is in its essence, a simple message. When Paul was worried that the church in Corinth would be deceived by the subtlety of Satan from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love to think of the gospel's perfection. I love to think of its beauty. I love to think uh, about its, uh, all of its boundaries and its depth. I love to read of the gospel and to hear the gospel preach. I love to preach the gospel. I love its depths. I love that the more that you learn of the gospel, the more that you see and the more that you realize how, how deep it is. The more you see, the more you love. And, and the more that you love, the more you dig in to see, and the more you learn, and the more you love it. And it's just, the, it's, it never fades. It never fades in, in its glory and its beauty. The, the old story of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ never fades in its beauty and never dims in its luster, but only gets brighter and more precious as we stare into it and meditate on it and think about it. And yet, this most precious story, the most glorious, glorious truth, was once a mystery. And it, it is still a mystery to some, but it was once a great mystery. And thank God, Christ, by His grace, has revealed this mystery. 
He's opened it up. He's taken the veil off. He's turned on the light. He's brought it out into the open for us to see and us to, to ponder. But not only has he done that, but he has given us the wisdom to see it. You know, for the Jews, it's foolishness. For the, uh, or for the Jews, it's a stumbling block. For the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to us, we know it is the power of God. And he has given us the wisdom to see it. So we can preach the gospel and make known the gospel of Jesus Christ and people can look at you with a blank stare. They don't even care or know what you're talking about. But to those who God gives the wisdom to receive it, it is the most glorious thing that we could ever uh, comprehend. Christ gave us the ability to understand his plan and his purpose of the gospel so that we can believe and have faith in the work of Jesus Christ according to his plan. That when it's, it's in time, he will make all things one. Those who were given to him, that he graciously gave faith to believe, having been predestinated. Um, he does all these things after his own will. And tonight we're going to look out for a little bit the understanding of the mystery of the gospel and wisdom. And, um, and we've been studying this for, for a while. And, and I was telling Crystal, I said, well, this is probably the most difficult part to kind of break up of the book of Ephesians, and I'll, I'll be gone, so I'll give me an extra week to think about it and pray about it. And uh, so in God's providence, as this morning, we don't get another week to think about it and pray about it. But uh, it's just, the reason it makes it difficult is if you notice, this is one big, long sentence that, um, that it's, it's a long sentence to... And I guess it's just the, the days and the times that we live in that the longer the sentences are, the, the, the harder it is to kind of grab a hold of the whole thing but, and, and kind of break it up and get the, the train of thought of it here. But that's what we'll look at tonight, this big, long sentence. And, and the punctuation in the Greek, there was no punctuation. So the punctuation is added by our, our, our translators. So sometimes even the punctua punctuation can throw us off a little bit. But that's what we want to look at tonight, this mystery uh, that God has revealed. In verse number 7, it says, um, in 7 and 8, it talks about the according to the riches of His grace. In whom we have redemption through His blood. So we have redemption through the blood of Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the, great, the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us. We are redeemed by His blood. We're purchased by His blood. The great cost of our salvation is, is the blood of Christ. It's free for us to receive. I believe in free grace, but it wasn't free to Jesus. Amen. It cost him a great price. And our <clears throat> sins are forgiven. The debt has been paid. Uh, I was reading uh, earlier this week on something else, but Martin Lloyd Jones was talking about the, the scandalous gospel of, of Christ, where um, he said sometimes when you preach the gospel, people might want to think you're an antinomian because. Uh, the, the scandalous nature of, of God's sovereign, amazing grace. Of course, we have uh, the, the, we know what we believe about the law, but, but what he was saying is when you focus on the grace, um, it, it can be misunderstood by the world. What we're talking about of God's free grace, that he forgives us of our sins, that the, the debt has been cleared, the, the debt has been erased. We are saved by grace and not by works. That unmerited, undeserved favor well, it says we have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Not from the riches of His grace, but according to the riches of His grace. And there's a big difference from giving according to your riches and giving from your riches. Well, here's an example. I read that when Bill Gates was at the height of his earning power in the late 90s, if you took the money that he made and put it into an hourly rate, he made about $300 a second. Uh, that's a lot of money, but if he's going to put it in an hourly rate, he made $300 per second. And one writer said that if he was on walking to work and he should see a $1,000 bill laying on the sidewalk, it wouldn't be worth his time to bend over and pick it up because he would lose um, a couple thousand dollars taking the time to stop and bend over and pick up the $1,000 bill. That's how much money that he was making at that time. Now, that's a lot of wealth. Now, if Bill Gates was to give you from his riches, that would be one thing. But what if he gave according to his riches? If he came in here and gave every one of us tonight $100, you know, I, 
You know, hundred dollars is a hundred dollars, but that would be from his riches. But if he was to come in here and to give us money according to his riches, that would be riches in proportion to how much he has. Now, if God says that he has come to us according to the riches of his grace, not from the riches, not, well, I have all riches of grace and I'm going to give you a, a part of it, but he's coming to us in proportion to the riches of his grace. And that's an amazing thought. That he abounds towards us according to the riches of his grace. So imagine the, the, the riches of grace. So we can't even begin to comprehend or wrap our mind around the greatness of God's grace towards us. And he comes in proportion to that great treasury of grace. That great treasury of, of love that he has uh, for us. So he comes to us according to the riches of his grace. Not just from it, but according to it. That is abundantly and graciously, lovingly came to us with grace. His grace has been given to us in abundance, far above what we can, what we can imagine. But the more that we consider our sin, and the more that we consider wickedness and how much God hates sin, and how holy God is, and what an affront to uh, God's holiness a, a sin is, the more that we understand that, the, the more we see how much God forgave us. And sometimes I don't think we really, really understand how heinous sin is. But, uh, well, if we did, we wouldn't, we wouldn't partake of it so freely as we do. And we can read Romans chapter number 1 and we can look out to the world and say, yeah, look at, look at them, look at the way the world lives with uh, their, their unnatural affections and all the sins in Romans 1. But then we get to Romans 2, we want to skip Romans 2 and get into Romans, Romans 3. Well, you know, we, we know better. And then sometimes God, people know better, and we do the same things. And we can say, yeah, the world's awful, the world uh, really sins, and then always looking out and never looking within. You know, it's easy to come and, and to preach, and I, it, I can really preach about the sins of uh, the Democratic Party or something like that, the sins of the government. It's really easy to, to, to do that and, and get everybody, yeah, that's right, they're really bad. But whenever it comes and gets us, that's whenever it hurts a little bit. But he came to us abundantly and graciously and lovingly with great grace towards us. He abounded towards us in grace. Well, secondly, we find wisdom and prudence. It says there in verse 8, where he abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Well, we can either take um, as it is with no punctuation, meaning that we're in Christ abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, or we can connect the wisdom and prudence to the beginning in verse number 9, where we can say he had... Um, he came to us according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded towards us. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. So we could connect wisdom and prudence to us, having him given us wisdom and prudence. So it could mean that God's grace was given according to his wisdom, or it could mean that God's grace towards us uh, is that he gave us wisdom. And, and you know, I wouldn't argue with it either way, but I believe it that it is in the context of the passage, the stress of it is the wisdom and prudence is what God gave to us. Now God is uh, wise, and the plan of salvation is, is wise, and Christ is wisdom personified, and he is the wisdom of God. But if we read it here, what I believe it means is that in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, that part of God coming to us with graciousness is him giving us the wisdom and prudence, having made a known unto us the gospel. So uh, I, that's what I believe it's saying here, that wisdom is the skill in living in the fear of the Lord. And using God's word and revelation to live in light of that information and knowledge is wisdom. It's taking what God has told us and living in that, in that light. Prudence means to understand or discernment or the knowledge of God's will. So working out in, a, in the application of wisdom. So we have knowledge and then we have wisdom. And then we take the, the wisdom and we have prudence. But how will we know who has the wisdom? 
Well, I think if we look backwards from the text, it'll make some more sense to us that if we start at the end and keep going back a little bit, we can see it a little bit more. We see that Christ has fulfilled all of this according to his good pleasure, wherein he hath purpose in himself. Okay, so um, Christ has fulfilled all of what he wanted to do according to his good pleasure. Now, he didn't do it out of prudence. He didn't fulfill everything out of prudence, but he fulfilled it all out of his good pleasure. And he did not do this out of understanding, but he did it out of his own purpose. So we see that Christ fulfilled all the things that he had set, set to do, that he did this according to his own counsel of his own will. He did this according to his own purpose. So he didn't do it because he thought it was the wisest thing, but he did it because that was his will, and his will was wise. Now Christ made known to us this mystery of his will. We know and understand this mystery by the wisdom and prudence that he gave us. The knowing and making known is placed upon us. So, so God made known this to us, and God gave us and gifted us with wisdom, of his wisdom. And he gave us the prudence to understand it, knowing what he has already planned out. So that's why I say that I wouldn't argue about it either way, because it, it is the wisdom of God in salvation. So God wisely mapped this all out, but we have to have the wisdom to receive it. And God gave us that wisdom by his grace. So, so either way, it, it, it points to what Christ does for us. But the knowing and the making known is, is placed that God is placed upon us. Christ is wise, but he gives people wisdom to understand his plain purpose. So in this wisdom and prudence, we are, uh, he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now in the Bible, the mystery is not something that, it's something that's unknown to us. It's something that has not yet been revealed. So when we read about mystery in the Bible, it's not something that isn't now known. But it's something that was unknown to us. So we don't look at this and say, well, this is a mystery. We can't know what God did because it was a mystery. But this is something that was at one time hidden but is now revealed. Um, there's some parallel passages in Colossians chapter number 1. And verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to the saints. So at one time there was a mystery. In the Old Testament economy, there was a mystery, you know, about how God could come and suffer, and yet God could come and reign. You know, that was a mystery. The prophets wrote things and didn't really understand what the true meaning behind it. And the prophets would prophesy of the word of God that God gave them, and they would take their own writings and study them. And they would read them and ponder about them, meditate on them, and look into this great mystery that they, they couldn't quite get their hands around. We would talk about uh, the Gentiles coming and being saved, and yet they saw how God had commanded them not to intermarry uh, with the Gentiles, and they looked and said, well, that's a mystery. I don't understand uh, what this is. Well, it was a mystery, but now it's made manifest. Now it is opened up. And then in Colossians 2, and verse 2, it says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto the all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So here we have another mystery um, that but we have the full assurance of understanding because we have Christ, and in Christ are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, so Christ is, the, is God's wisdom, and in him is the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. So God has graciously blessed us with understanding into this mystery, uh, wherein uh, we see the gospel, the mystery of redemption. So this divine wisdom has been revealed to us. The cover of this great mystery has been taken off. So if you think about maybe David, as he was penning Psalm 22, and start, was talking about, um, he's probably talking about himself in a poetic form, but looks at that and, and, and thinks of <coughs> uh, he who was hated and, and 
And as the saints would read Psalm 22 it's, and, and see that there's something there, something more than just David. Well, what Psalm 22, of course, is prophesying of the crucifixion. And as David would look at that, he would wonder this mystery, uh, what the, the depth that is behind it, and, and perhaps even know it was a messianic psalm, but, but not fully grasp everything behind it. Because crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. And here David is pinning a, a, a hymn about it. Or to go to Psalm 23 and talk about the Lord being his shepherd. And, and study that and ponder that, but not really thinking about uh, that Christ is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the, the, the door of the sheep, and, and so forth. Or Psalm 24, uh, thinking about the, the King Jesus and the, the messianic psalm. And so they would sing those psalms and maybe think about it. But now, in Christ, that mystery has been revealed, the, the cover has been taken off, and we can look in the Old Testament and see what Psalm 22 was about the crucifixion. And Psalm 23 was about our shepherd, Lord, and Savior. And Psalm 24 is about the, the kingship of Christ. And Isaiah 53 details uh, the Son of God and, and what He did for us in relationship to the Father and substitutionary atonement and, and on and on. So that mystery has been revealed to us. It's been opened up. Romans uh, 16 uh, and that, the great uh, passage here in Romans 16, verse 25. It says, Now unto him is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. One time it was a mystery. But according to the revelation of the mystery, the opening up, the, the making manifest, and the scriptures and the prophets, now it has been opened up to us that that, that mystery has been revealed. And God in His wisdom gave us wisdom to see it. Um, all throughout the book of Ephesians you have that. In Ephesians 3, 6-9 through 9, you have the mystery of the Jews and the Gentiles together as one. Um, Ephesians 5.32, you um, probably all know that, uh, the mystery of the church, and in, in, uh, the husbands and wife, and the, the nature of the church, the one flesh. Uh, man shall leave his father and mother, and two shall be joined to his wife, and two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now that doesn't mean that we can't understand what that means. It doesn't mean, well, that's a mystery we just don't even know. That means that was something that was once revealed, that, or covered up. That was something that the Old Testament, you, you talk about the, the church, they just look at you. What do you mean the church? What do you mean the, the assembly? When we come and gather together, and, you know, they didn't have any idea about the nature of the church. Um, you know, but, but it's a mystery. It's been, it's been revealed. The, the bride of Christ, you uh, they, didn't, they had no understanding of the bride of Christ, but that was a mystery. But now it's been opened up. It's been revealed. The mystery of the gospel in full re uh, revelation in the sixth chapter in verse number 19. And for me, the utterance may be given that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And here we have Paul... Um, Asking for prayer. And if you want to pray for me, you want to pray for preachers, this is a good prayer. That I'm, he asked that they pray for him for boldness, for clarity, and for faithfulness. And if you want to pray for me, you pray that I would have boldness, clarity, and faithfulness in the preaching. Well, that's what Paul asked for. But he, but he said that he may make known the mystery of the gospel. So if, if it's a mystery that we don't know anything about, how is he going to make it known? What it is, it, it was revealed, he says, Pray for me that I have the boldness and I have the clarity of my words and I'm faithful to make known this mystery. To let everybody know that the cover's off. That it's been, the light's been turned on. Here is the mystery of godliness in Christ Jesus. God's made it known to us this mystery. And the fact that we're not able to discover can only show uh, discover only uh, if God reveals it to us, it makes it even more of grace. Because once God shows it to us, it's the sweetest of all words. Once God shows it to us, it is the most glorious of all thoughts. 
Once God shows you this mystery and opens your eyes to it, you, you should think, how could I have been so foolish to go so long without believing it? Maybe you had that experience. Maybe when the Lord saved you, you just, you just thought, well, how dumb could I have been to not sing this all along? Well, you didn't know that it was, a, it was grace that God opened your eyes to see it and, and He opened your ears to hear it and gave you life that you can understand these mysteries. But, but you know, that, that's common just to think, well, how could I have been so foolish? It was right here all along. It's like the lights were turned out and you could, and you walked in this building and you didn't know what was in here and then all of a sudden you turn the lights on, you see pews, you see a pulpit, piano, organ. And you say, oh, I see, it's been revealed to me. Well, they were here when the lights were off and you just couldn't see them. But the lights came on and it was opened up to you. Well, that's what happens when God saves us. He, he by His grace, brings us in and turns the lights on and shows us what has already been there, what's been there all along. It's new to us, but God illuminated it. And that's, uh, that's what theologians talk about when we talk about illumination. That the light's been turned on and the light is on now. And we can see what has always been there. Um, it's not Gnosticism where it's secret knowledge that nobody can know. No, it's right here. It's in a book. And you can go and you can open up and read it for yourself. But it's a spiritual book, and God has to turn the lights on so you can read it. And when it's not, it's not a mystery in the sense that no one can know, and it's not Gnosticism where only certain people have access to it, but it's right here in the book where anybody that can read, anybody that has ears, can have somebody read it to them, and it's right here. But God has to give you the wisdom and the prudence to receive it. Why did he do this? Because he chose to. He purposed to. That was his purpose according uh, to his good pleasure. According to his good pleasure, he did this. Verse number 9. According to his good pleasure, when he has purposed in himself. His good pleasure, or if you look at that word, it, it, his sovereign purpose, his kind intention, intention. According to his good, kind, sovereign purpose, he determined, he, he purposed, he, he exhibited his grace, graciousness. According to his sovereign purpose, his kind, benevolent, good intention, God purposed to, in this, in himself, to make this known. Just because he wanted to. Just because he is good. You know, when Adam died, and, and all men died in Adam, and we were all guilty, God did not have to open these things up to us. God did not have to reveal this to us. He did not have to illumine our eyes and our hearts. He did not have to make our hearts hearts of flesh to receive these truths. He didn't have to. But according to his good pleasure, his sovereign purpose, his kind intention, he purposed to exhibit and, and he determined to make this known to us. He determined to give us the wisdom and the prudence to receive it because he is a good and wise and kind and gracious God. That in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in here. The Father had given all things to Christ, and when the fullness of times had come, um, to, he accomplished all things according to that plan and purpose. So you have God having a plan and a purpose uh, to gather all things together. So before creation, God had planned and purpose to glorify himself in this great plan of redemption. God's not making it up as he goes along. But he had a purpose. And the end result is to have all things in one in Christ. So God planned uh, the end from the beginning. He ordained it. And the end was that he would be glorified in Christ and all things would be in him. And according to his wisdom and his sovereign good pleasure, everything from the beginning worked according to, to get to this end. We talked about God's providence, and we had one little slice of history this morning that we looked at where God worked in, in every little detail imaginable to get that one in. Well, that was one little slice of history. You think about the whole of creation, that God purposed and planned the whole of creation. He made a universe to be a stage in which um, His, his uh, glory would be revealed. He made the earth and the universe of stars and heavens to be the, the stage in which he would be glorified in this. He created time and, and the stars and the heavens and the earth and the seasons. 
He created all of this. That in the end, he would be glorified in Christ and all things would be one in heaven and earth, even in him. So he's going to gather all in one in Christ. All God's people. Men and women and Jew and Gentile, old covenant saints and new covenant saints, uh, <clears throat> we're all in the family of God and we're all going to be in Him in one. So here we have a reference to the family of God. And in the book of Ephesians, there's, I believe there's a big distinction between the family of God and the church. And we don't want to get those two um, interchangeable because they're not interchangeable. The church is not the family of God. Though um, the church is part of the family of God, those terms are not synonymous. Um, so we have to keep those straight. But here we have talking about the family of God being all in one in Christ, even in Him. Then in, ver in verses 11 and 12 and 13, we kind of tie it all back together. That in these verses, we find that God talks about His grace, wisdom, and having all things in one. So we've seen three things so far. And in these uh, last three verses we'll look at, he kind of ties it all back together. In whom we have obtained an, an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now we should be to the praise of the glory who first trusted in Christ. So the one who planned the redemption is the one who accomplished the redemption with his blood. And he is the one who abounded towards us in grace and the one who gave us the ability to understand and believe it. He planned and accomplished all things so that all things in heaven and earth would be one in him. And it's in him who also we have obtained an inheritance. Not just forgiven, which is a big thing, and not only redeemed, which is a big thing, but gathered to be together in one in Christ, which is an amazing thing but also to receive an inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance. And whenever I was looking at this and studying this, there's one Greek word for all five of those English words. We have obtained an inheritance. Uh, those English words come from one Greek word, which means an allot, or to cast lots, something that's been assigned to you by law. So we have obtained an inheritance. It was totally given to us. It was out of our hands to get that inheritance. It was something that was allotted to us by someone else. The, the lot is in the hands of the Lord. And, and we have obtained an inheritance as an allotment given to us by somebody else that was had nothing to do with us. That was totally out of our hands and all of grace in Christ whom we have had, we have been given this allotment. We have been, we have received something that we had no control over obtaining. I mean, it was given to us just by His grace. It was predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. <clears throat> and when I read that, it just there's just so much there, and just so much glorious, sovereign grace in that, in that just that one half of a sentence that we were predestinated. We weren't. Uh, I read somebody said the Armenians think that we're post-destinated. That God. Uh, uh, plans after he sees into the future into who's going to believe. He said that's not predestination, that's post-destination. That, that God works after. Well, we're predestinated. Predestinated. That it was predetermined according to his purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So the one that does everything the way he wants to and, and everything that he plans comes to pass, he is the one that predestined us to have an inheritance according to the way that he ordained it. It's just sovereign grace after sovereign grace. Uh, and, and every way you look at it, this verse, from, from every angle, it shows God's omnipotent, sovereign grace in salvation. That he works all things after the counsel of his own will. Not after our will or after anyone else's will, but his own will he does this. His own will, not... Uh, compromised or not influenced by our will and our desire, but all this happens according to the counsel of his own will. He doesn't counsel with us or doesn't counsel with any other creature, but he works all things after his own counsel of his own will. Why? That we should be to the praise of the glory you first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 
We trusted in him, in verse 13, in whom also we trust, and trust is in italics. So that means it's supplied, but it's connected to the trust in verse 12. Who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye trusted, after you heard the word of truth. So we heard the word of truth and we trusted in Christ. And that brings us all the way back to the beginning where it talks about the wisdom of prudence. That, that we should praise Christ and his glory when we first trusted in Christ, in whom we trusted after we heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So God predestinated all this to happen. He gave us all this grace, and we receive it by believing the gospel truth. That we heard the, the word of truth. We trusted in him who heard the word of truth. We heard the gospel God opened our eyes, we believed the gospel, and we received salvation, we received Christ. So it gets so deep that it's almost beyond words to explain, and it just kind of overwhelms you to think about. And when we get to verse 13, it just gets back to so simple, it's just so simple grace and truth that we trust in Christ, we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and we were saved. So you get to all that depth and all those riches of his grace and you get back to the end and it's just the, the, the simplicity of the gospel. You heard that Jesus died for sinners you believe that he died for your sins. You repented and trusted him and now you're saved. What a, what a glorious gospel. What a glorious gospel. We heard that word of truth. Can we make Christ known this week? That's our task. That's our purpose. To make Christ known. Well, somebody told you the old, old story. I bet you're glad that somebody told you the gospel. I know I'm glad I heard the gospel from somebody. Amen. I wasn't saved by the technique of the person that gave it, <coughs> but by the power of God. It was the power of God that gave me the wisdom to understand this. And all it was was somebody presented the gospel truth. They just told the story. And God, by His grace, took those words and he opened my ears to hear it. And it was like I, you know, I'd heard it a million times before, but that time when I heard that, it was real. And I heard the word of truth. And I trusted in him. So you don't have to have a great technique, and you don't have to have some kind of showman skills. And you just have to be like the people in the Gospels. And, and you know, all they did was uh, they would ask people questions. So well, I'm not sure about that, but well, let me tell you what I do know. I was once blind, and now I can see. Well, I, I don't know all about that, but let me tell you a man who knew everything about me, told me everything I ever did. Well, that, that's what they did. They, they told them what they knew, uh, the truth. And it was just simple, plain terms. I'm a sinner, and this man forgives sins. Let's make Christ known this week. Let's make Christ known. Because it's not our technique, and it's not our skills. It is the word of truth. It is the power of God. And the gospel message is just our faithfulness to say this is what Jesus did. And we leave it in God's hands to apply whatever he did to that. Well, we pray that God will bless the word tonight. Pray that God will bless our hearts. And be with us this week. And watch over us. We'll stand uh, this time for word of prayer.